We're going to turn now to God's Word in Genesis chapter 4. At the beginning of your Bible, Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to walk through the whole chapter this morning, considering the spread of sin and the mercy of God. So let me pray for help as we dive in together. Our Heavenly Father, would you send your Holy Spirit to put the spotlight on Jesus? Would you help us to know more of him, to know more of ourselves? Would you help us to take the next step of obedience with Christ today? It's in his name we pray. Amen. So have you ever wondered why little kids, really little kids, steal toys from their friends and their siblings? It's a bizarre thing, really. Their parents don't teach them to do that. They don't hold classes on how to be sneaky and steal toys. This is especially weird because it's so hard to teach your kids just about anything else. It's hard to teach them how to tie their shoes, how to read, to teach them math, kindness, table manners, and so on. So why is selfishness like second nature for kids? Well, Genesis 4 helps us make sense of this. In Genesis 3, we see the root of sin when Adam and Eve disobey God. And then in Genesis 4, we see the fruit of sin. Genesis 4 teaches us that sin spreads from parents to kids, and that sin will increase if it goes unchecked. This chapter makes sense of the global human experience that all people everywhere of all ethnicities were born with selfish and destructive desires in their heart. So today we're going to learn about sin, what it is, how it hurts us, but we'll also learn more about God. He doesn't abandon us. He moves towards us patiently, and he mercifully offers help. If you put the message of Genesis 4 in a nutshell, it is this. Sin seeks to hurt you, but God seeks to help you. Sin seeks to hurt you, but God seeks to help you. And we're going to see this back and forth between sin and God through this chapter. So first, sin spreads, and then God offers help. And then sin worsens, and then God offers hope. So let's first, let's start in uh, verse 1. We're going to see how sin spreads from Adam and Eve to their children. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord God had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do, not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So here we see Adam and Eve. They're freshly kicked out of the garden. And yet Eve has a glimmer of hope. It's kind of like the morning after a really bad night. Maybe some of you could remember night where you had a really bad argument with your spouse. Or some of you remember a really awful night where you did things behind closed doors that you knew were wrong. And you woke up the next morning and you heard bird song and you saw a light stream through your window. Even though the night was dark, you have hope in the morning. That's kind of where Eve is at right now. She's hopeful even though she sinned against God and she was judged for it, that things would turn around. And there really is a good start in the beginning of Genesis. So it says, Adam knew Eve, his wife. That's a beautiful, delicate way of saying that Adam and Eve had sex. And they're enjoying this relational intimacy together. God gives them children. God provides help and helps Eve through the pains of childbirth. Both kids grow up to find good work. Cain takes after his father. He's a worker of the ground. Abel opens up his own business. He herds sheep. And then it gets even better. These two boys, they want to know God. So there's some sense in which this family is experiencing the goodness of God. 
But Eve's hope goes deeper than just good jobs for her kids. Eve hopes in the promise of God. If you go back to chapter 3 and verse 15, God is judging the serpent, the snake, who's the devil, who led Adam and Eve away. And he says this, God says this to the snake, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, that's the offspring of Eve, will strike your head, snake, and you will strike his heel. So God said, there's going to be a war between Satan's kids and Eve's kids. And one of Eve's kids, a boy, is going to be born and he's going to go to war with the snake and he's going to win. Adam and Eve carried the hope of this promise even after they left the garden. And maybe Cain would be the snake crusher. So Eve has this hope after a dark night of the fall. But at verse five, we come to something and it's something's not right here. It said, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So why didn't God accept Cain's offering? So there's a few main reasons, a few main answers that people suggest. The first is the sacrifice itself. So some people say, well, God wanted a bloody sacrifice. He wanted an animal, not produce from the ground. But that can't be it. Later in Israel's history, in the books of Moses, we see that God requires both animal sacrifices and grain and produce. So it's not the sacrifice itself. Some people say Cain didn't have his offering accepted because of the quality of his sacrifice. So Abel offers the best of his flock, the firstborn and the fattest. Cain simply offers, it says, an offering from the fruit of the ground. This may be part of the answer why they didn't offer their best. But we even have a better answer as we go through the Bible. It's not the quality of the sacrifice that makes it unacceptable. It's the quality of Cain's heart. As we go through the Old Testament, God tells Israel over and over again, what matters most in your sacrifice is your heart attitude towards me of faith. And in Hebrews 11, 4 in the New Testament, it says this, By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable offering than Cain did. So this is the reason why God didn't accept Cain's offering, because Cain didn't have faith. There was something off in his heart. We hear in 1 John that Cain had an evil heart, and he was of his father, the devil, and he expressed it in evil deeds. So where did Cain get this twisted heart? Well, Adam passed this sin on to his son, Cain. In the Bible, there's this teaching of original sin, and it means that all human beings were born with a sinful nature. We don't just learn sin from our parents and our culture. We're not just sinners by nurture, but we're also sinners by nature. And God steps in and starts teaching Cain about the nature of sin. So in verse 7, that's the first introduction to the word sin we have in the Bible. And God says, sin is crouching at the door. So how do we define sin? From Genesis 3, we could define it as disobeying God's life-giving commands. Simply put, it's just disobeying God's commands. Here in Cain's life, sin is any destructive thought, word, or deed. But God here in chapter 4, he doesn't give us a definition of sin. He gives us a description of sin. He illustrates it. He says, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It's like a beast who's scratching at the door waiting to devour you. In Mesopotamia, in this area of the world, um, in this time in the world, it was a common belief that there was a doorway demon. And this demon would hang outside your door and you couldn't open the door at certain times because if you did, the demon would enter your home and attack you. Um, maybe that's what God has in mind here. For me, the image that came into my mind is from Stranger Things, the Demogorgon. And if you've seen Stranger Things, you know what I'm talking about. It's this like demonic beast who's ready to devour you. And God is saying sin is like that. Sin is like the Demogorgon and don't crack the door open. I wonder if you remember when you were a little kid and you're playing tag with your sibling or your friend and they were chasing you and you ran into a room and slammed the door shut. And as long as you had that door shut, you had the upper hand. You, had, you were in the strong position. But once your sibling, your brother, your sister got their foot or their head in the door, 
game over. And so God is saying, don't let sin get its head or its foot in the door or it's going to devour you. Cain, it's kill or be killed. It's either going to master you or you're going to master it. So I want us to pause here and let God's word shape our attitude towards our own personal sin. We all should take sin more seriously. We play with temptation like it's something we can control. But if you're a Christian here and if you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, you've no doubt seen Christian leaders and Christian friends walk away from Jesus. And here we're reminded that every big fall started with a little compromise. Our friends who may have fallen away from Jesus, they first thought they were in control, but they quickly ended up in control of sin. So let's take our sin seriously. It's a beast. Don't crack open that door. If you're, if you're tempted towards envying other people, maybe people who have different things that you don't have and you want that, don't open the door of Instagram right now. And don't browse for hours seeing what other people have and growing that envy. If you're tempted to look at pornography, do not surf the web. Step away from the phone. Step away from the computer. If you're tempted to feed anger towards someone, take a step back and quiet your heart before God. Sin is a beast, and we see that sin spreads from Adam to Eve to their kids. And so where is God in all this? God draws near to Cain to offer help. And that's what we see next. God offers help. Let's refocus on verse six and seven. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Even though Cain is outside of the garden, away from God's presence, God draws near to Cain and he offers help. God asks questions aimed at Cain's heart. God warns him of sin. And if you see it there, God wants to accept Cain. He wants heart change in Cain. He says, if you do well, if you resist sin, I would love to accept you. And God still helps us now by sending us his son and his Holy Spirit. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to seek and save the lost. Jesus is God with us. He comes to us in the wilderness and says, come, let's do well. Let's turn from sin. He gives us the Holy Spirit to point out destructive desires. And he gives us power to slay the demon of sin. I see there's rich application here for parents. We're called to imitate our heavenly father. We see here, God, he draws near his children when he's disciplining them. He doesn't parent from the couch. And if you're, you're parents of young kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. At the end of a long day, it's so easy to just sit on the couch and just to raise your voice. Say, stop it. What are you doing? But God draws near and he gets on Cain's level. Let's ask questions that seek at helping our children understand their hearts and the situation. Let's warn our children. And in all of this, let's Let's uh, seek aim that they would know that we are for them, just as God was for Cain. Let them know time and time again, even in discipline, no matter how bad things get, I am for you. So we see God offers help. And the rest of the chapter follows two families, Cain's and Seth's. One family rejects God's help. That's Cain's family. And the other family turns to God for help. That's Seth's family. There are two ways to live. And will we receive God's help in our fight with sin or will we reject it? Well, sadly, Cain, he rejects God's help. And we're going to see the devastating effects when we turn from God. So sin worsens. You see that sin spreads, God offers help, and now sin worsens. Sin worsens first in Cain's life. Look at verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. 
And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I could bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be like a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord God said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So in verse 6 and 7, God offers his help to Cain. And in these verses, we see the fruit of rejecting God's help. Cain stewed on his anger. He stewed on his jealousy toward his brother. He called him out to the field and he murdered his brother Abel. This is devastating. Imagine how this worked on Eve. She was expecting Cain to be the snake crusher, but he ended up crushing her youngest son. He turned out to be a murderer. And the result is God responds with justice and mercy. Just like he responded to his parents, Adam and Eve, he comes with judgment, but also mercy. God asks him questions. Where is your brother? Of course, he knows where Abel is as God, but he's drawing Cain's heart out. But Cain answers with a lie. Cain's sins escalate. Remember when God came to Adam and Eve after they ate from the forbidden fruit? They just blame shifted. They admitted that they did wrong, but they blame shifted. Here, Cain is flat out lying to God. He's saying, I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper? This is the fruit of rejecting God's help against sin. And so God judges him. He says, you can't hide this from me. The ground that drank up Abel's blood is crying out judgment against you, Cain. Before we look at this judgment, I want to step aside and look at how Hebrews, how the New Testament takes up the blood of Abel. So maybe in this story, maybe you're identifying with Cain saying, in my life, I've really screwed it up. I've opened the door to sin and this monster has taken control of my life. I'm like Cain, I lie. I'm like Cain, I don't care for my brother and sister. Is there any hope for me? And the author of Hebrews says, yes, there is good news for Cain. People like Cain. In Hebrews 12, 24, it says, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant and his sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What was the blood of Abel saying? It was saying, Cain is guilty. Cain is damned. What does the blood of Jesus willingly shed for sinners say over us? Not guilty, not condemned. This is good news for those of us who have opened the door to sin in our lives, have rejected God's help. God extends forgiveness. God extends new life to you in Jesus Christ. And all who place their faith in Jesus have the blood of Jesus proclaimed over you saying, not guilty, no matter what you've done in your whole life, no matter what you've done this week or this morning, not guilty. My blood has been spilled for you. And it speaks a better word than Abel. And we're going to celebrate that as we go to the Lord's table after the service, sermon. So getting back to Genesis, we see that Cain has to bear judgment. And he's pushed away from this agricultural job. The ground no longer yields its fruit to him. And so he's pushed further away from the presence of God into a land of Nod, which means wandering. And Cain responds with fear of being killed. We see the irony here. The killer is afraid of being killed. But God mercifully responds and he puts a mark on Cain. I don't know what this uh, mark looked like. If it was like a tattoo or the Harry Potter, like lightning bolt on his head. But it was some kind of mark telling all the people around Cain saying, don't kill him. Because if you kill Cain, I will take vengeance on you sevenfold. So God judges him, but mercifully judges him. He doesn't put him to death on the spot. So we see that sin worsens in Cain's life, but it also worsens in Cain's family. Look at verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. The, uh, to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methushael. 
Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jubal. He was the father, oh, Jabal, Lord help me with these names. Uh, Jabal, he was the father of those who dwelt in tents and had livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who played the lyre and pipe. Those are musical instruments. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The, t- the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me and a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. So we see the spiral of sin in the following generation in Lamech's or, or Cain's family. First, you might be wondering though, Cain married what? Adam and Eve were the first people on the earth. And then you have Cain and Abel are the only two boys. Who in the world did Cain marry? Well, if you go over to Genesis 5, Genesis 5, 5 says, Adam lived for 930 years. If you go up to verse 4, it says, he had Seth, but he also had other sons and daughters. So this is weird. This is kind of the beginning of the world, beginning of uh, uh, human, hum, human family. But Cain married one of his sisters. And then as we go down here, we see these seven generations of Cain go deeper and deeper into sin. One glaring omission in verses 17 through 24 is the name of God. And especially after going through Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, where God was the main character, God created and God saw and God said that it was good and God walked in the garden. In Cain's seven generations of family, you won't find in there the name of God. There seems to be a connection between Cain turning from the presence of God and the lack of God's presence in his family. And Lamech is even worse than his father, great-great-grandfather Cain. Lamech breaks the pattern of marriage. Did you catch it there? He had two wives. He kills a man for striking him. And he doesn't hide his sin. He's not ashamed of his sin, but he writes a song about his sin and he boasts of it to his wives, maybe threatening them not to get out of line. So he's an abusive, violent man boasting in his wickedness. And he doesn't entrust his vengeance to God like Cain did. But he says, I'll take vengeance 77 fold. So this is the fruit of turning from God. But if you notice in verse 20 and 21, even though Cain's family was such a wicked family, they created musical instruments. They created tools and weapons. They created technology with tents and how to develop livestock. And so this shows us that Cain's family is spiritually broken, but they're making beautiful things. And they're still made in God's image. And this is true for all people. The worst person you know morally, the most morally corrupt person you know, is still made in the image of God. And God in his mercy still works beautiful things through them. But this technology, these instruments, these livestock, these tents, these tools were not helping them grow spiritually. One commentator said, the flowering of culture and invention does not restrain the escalation of sin. Technology is not the way of salvation. And we need to hear that in New England where we put such an emphasis on education and medication and cultural creation. These are all good gifts, but they are powerless in renewing our souls. For that, we need God. So these verses show us what we could expect if we reject God's offer of help and open the door to our sinful desires. We lose God, we go from bad to worse, and our sin ravages our children and future generations. So that's Cain's family. But there's also another family. So let's consider what it looks like to turn to God for help. God offers hope. Look at verse 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, 
and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So Eve's hope is resilient. She renews her hope. And notice that this chapter begins with Eve conceiving and bearing a son, and it ends with Eve conceiving and bearing a son. And so she says, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel because Cain killed him. Notice at the beginning of chapter 4, in verse 1, she says, I have gotten a man with the Lord's help. If you go to the end of 4, in verse 25, she says, God has appointed for me another offspring. We've heard that word before, offspring. That is the word God used in Genesis 3.15, saying, Eve, I'm going to give you an offspring to crush the head of the snake. So Eve here, her hope is growing. Her longing is growing in the promise of God. And she is looking for this offspring. She's saying, maybe Seth is the one to heal all these wounds, to restore all that is broken. And Seth and his people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. This doesn't mean they were, they were the first to offer sacrifices to God, but just publicly, out of longing for God to step into the brokenness, they start calling on God, asking him for help. And in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, we see that Jesus, in a way, is the son of Seth. He comes in the line of Seth, and he indeed is the offspring to crush the head of the snake. I want to compare and contrast these two families. So the family of Cain and the family of Seth. All throughout the Bible, you see a distinction between two kinds of people, the righteous and the wicked, the children of God and the children of devil, the devil. And I want to compare and contrast them. First, compared. Both the children of God and the children of the devil are sinners. I want to contrast them. The children of the devil do not look to God for help with their sin. And the children of God look to God for help. This might encourage you to take a step toward Jesus if you're not following him yet. Maybe you look at Christians and you think, I need to clean myself up before I become a Christian. I need to better myself before I come to Jesus. But you're getting it all twisted. We come to Jesus so that he cleans us and washes us and makes us better. That's the only difference between Christians and non-Christians. Both sinners, but Christians just look to God and say, help me, help me, and he will receive you. So how can we receive help in our fight with sin? We could pull this slide up. How can we receive help in our fight with sin? First, just start with admitting your need for God. That's what Cain should have done. Admit his need for God. I can't tame this sin beast that I find within me, God. I need your help. Next, ask for the Holy Spirit's strength. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's God Almighty. And when you rely on Jesus alone, he enters you and he fights with you and for you. Then answer God's fatherly questions. So when you feel a sin taking hold of your heart, maybe it's anger, sit down and let God ask you those questions. Why are you angry? Think about that. Maybe, maybe journal that out. What's making you angry? Where are you right now? These same questions that God asked Adam and Eve and Cain when they sinned. And finally, accept help. God has given us so many resources for help. One resource, the chief one, is the gospel itself, a message that week after week, day after day, you come to this good news that says the blood of Jesus is not speaking condemnation over you for what you just did but it's speaking life and peace and forgiveness. Another resource is friends. Do you have some trusted friends that could help you in your battle with sin? When you feel tempted or when you've fallen, people you trust and you could bear your soul to them. Another useful resource is counseling. So if you feel like you're at wit's end with an addiction or a sin, there's no shame in finding a good counselor. There's, there's many good counselors. They don't have to be Christian. There's also very good Christian counselors in the area. And we, as your pastors, would love to help you in that area if you want to make progress in battling sin. And so sin seeks to hurt us, but God seeks to help us. Will you receive his merciful help? Cain rejected his help, and the consequences were devastating on his life and his descendants. 
Sure, they had beautiful instruments, they had beautiful tools and the latest agricultural technology, but under, underneath the surface, they were a wreck. Their family was filled with pride, vengeance, anger, murder, and lacked the presence of God. But you don't have to follow the way of Cain. You can follow the way of Eve and the way of Seth and call on God for help. He's more than willing to help. He pursues us with fatherly intent to help us defeat sin through the blood of Christ and through the Holy Spirit's power. Let's pray. Father, we ask for help. We admit that we cannot overcome sin apart from you. We thank you, Father, so much that you are a father patiently pursuing us, never giving up on us. Thank you for sending Jesus and your Holy Spirit to help us, to not fight against us, but to fight with us and for us. May we receive the help we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.